to us in a mighty way, I pray in your name. Amen. We're week three of this series that we're calling The End. It's a series on the end times. Um, and it's easy for us as you look at the news and you look at all the things that are playing out in the world around us. You hear about coronavirus and how it's just rapidly spreading to sit there and go, okay, is this it? Like, do I need to be prepared? Are we at the end times? And so we just decided, let's take some time and let's just dive in. Let's take a look at what does the Bible actually teach us about the end times and what we should expect. Week one, we just talked about the fact that, yes, Jesus is going to come again. And that's going to be a great thing. That's a a moment of hope and it's a moment of reunion. And what does that mean? How do we prepare for that? Last week, Scott did a great job of just kind of walking us through kind of some of the signs that we can watch for, things like a tribulation, a period of lawlessness, a a person of lawlessness that's going to come about. Today, we're going to specifically be talking about your end times, meaning we're going to be talking about that moment where you and I, all of us, we have a designated moment where we're going to stand face to face with our creator. Whether or not Jesus happens to come back in our lifetime or in a distant future, All of us at some point are going to stand face to face before our creator and there'll be a judgment that takes place. The Bible actually talks about two different judgments that are going to take place. And I want us to just take a look at those and and how are they described? How are they talked about? And what does it mean for you and I when it comes to understanding this? Now, today we're going to be walking through a lot of different passages. And I'm just going to tell you, if you try to keep up with me, you're going to have blisters on the ends of your fingers by the time we're done because... Your pages are going to be on fire, all right? Um, So I purposely put them all up on the screen to make it a little easier to be able to follow along with me today. But here's kind of a a beginning thought when it comes to just talking about the end times and specifically judgment. Now, next week, we're going to talk about heaven. So don't miss next week. Um, I think it's one of those conversations that doesn't honestly take place enough in the local church. And we're going to take some time and we're going to talk about what does the Bible talk about heaven. But today, when it comes to talking about judgment, I want to begin by reading a a passage from Revelation chapter 22. Now, Revelation is a book in the Bible. It's the very last book of the Bible. It's written by a guy named John. John is kind of the best friend of Jesus. And at the end of his life, he's been exiled on an island called Patmos over in Greece. And he has this moment at the end of his life where God gives him a a vision, a revelation of the end and kind of what to expect. And he captures those thoughts here. Now, if you've ever tried to read through the book of Revelation, it's a difficult book to read through. A lot of it is the allegorical, dramatic language that is used in here. It's, uh, what do I make sense of? I just want to help you understand. When you you read that, it's helpful to understand you have somebody that's seeing something that there is not language for what he's experiencing and seeing. So he's doing his best to put language to the experience of what he just walked through. Now, Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 12, we get this glimpse of kind of in judgment that will take place. It says, look, I'm coming soon. Talking about Jesus. Bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. So there'll be a payment. There'll be a reward. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end. Now, If you're new to Christianity, or maybe this whole experience is new to you, I want to be very, very clear in this. We are, none of us are qualified by how good we are to get to heaven. The truth is, none of us are good enough. We all wrestle, we all make mistakes, and as a result, we are all sinners. And the only way that we are made right with God is by our faith in Jesus Christ. We are made right with God by grace that is given to us through faith. And as a result of that, we are forgiven by Jesus and what Jesus did. For those that are Christians, it's very important for us to know that although your works will never qualify you for heaven, however, the way you live it will determine how you will be rewarded in heaven. I find that conversations I've had with Christians over years and years and years in the church, there's, just an under, there's a lack of an understanding that there is a judgment moment even for us as Christians. It's different, but there is a conversation that you are going to have with God. 
And it's all centered around to determine how you will be rewarded in heaven for how you lived on earth. Here's an example of maybe what we can expect. There's a pastor and an Uber driver that find themselves at the gates of heaven at the same time. The pastor and the Uber driver are met by St. Peter. He says, hey, welcome, we've been expecting you. And because of the way you've lived on your life, we have built you a home for you to make your home here for all of eternity. They first, they walk over to the pastor's house and they look at the house, it's a beautiful house, it's modest, it's got everything that he needs. And he goes, this is great. Then they walk across the street and he goes, Uber driver, this is your house. And it just dwarfed the pastor's house. It was huge, it was a mansion, and beautiful pools. I mean, it was just beautiful. And the pastor goes, hey, wait, 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 wait a minute. This is based on the way that we lived on earth, right? And he goes, I gave my whole life preaching and teaching and being in the church. Why do I have this house? And the Uber driver, all he did was drive people around. Why does he have this house? Which St. Peter replied, he goes, well, every time you stood up and preached and teach, you just put people to sleep. The Uber driver, every time he had somebody in his car, they ended up on their knees praying. Bad joke, okay? But guys, what I want us to know is there is going to be a moment when we stand before Jesus and they will be rewarded as Christians. So have you ever thought, what is that moment going to be like when you stand face to face with your creator? I mean, will that moment be filled with awe, fear, shame, guilt, love? What will judgment actually entail? Because some of you have grown up hearing thoughts like, well, when you stand before God, he's going to take this big jumbo screen and he's going to play out your entire life right there. And then he's going to talk to you about all the very specific things that went on in your life. And for some of you, that in itself is enough to just keep you on the right, the right path, right? Others of you, you hear that and go, might as well just send me to hell. That's not exactly the way it's going to play out. But today... I do want to talk about that the Bible talks about two very specific judgments. And here's the truth. Here's the thing that I want us to hold on to as we make our way through this conversation. And it's simply this. In the end, there are two different types of people. There are going to be people that say to God, God, your will be done. In other words, it's all about you. It's all about what you want me to do. I will go where you call me to go no matter what the ask is. And then there will be people that God will say to them, well, your will be done. Here's what we need to understand. Both of those have eternal consequences. And that's what I want to talk about today, is is why there are two different judgments and the eternal consequences that we can expect. Now, the first judgment that I want us to tackle today is what is called the judgment seat of Christ. If you're taking notes, go ahead and write that down. The judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's described in a couple different passages in the Bible, and so I'm going to read two of these passages. This is from Romans chapter 14, verse. It says, For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Here's another description of it from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due to us, do us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad, or good or evil. Now, it's helpful for us to understand the context by which this is written. This is written by the same guy named Paul. He's writing letters to Christians in different locations. So as you begin to unravel the context, it's clear that these passages refer to Christians and not those that are unbelievers, not those that haven't yet placed their faith in Jesus. The judgment seat of Christ, therefore, involves believers giving an account of their lives to and before Jesus. Christians are not judged here for salvation or damnation. You've already been saved but this is a judgment for rewarding you for all the good works done on, during your time while you lived on earth. Now, here's the interesting perspective that I think helps us in, get to this conclusion. The original word here that was used, now the majority of the New Testament was written in Greek. 
the original word that is used here that we now translate today as the judgment seat of Christ is the word bima. Bema, B-E-M-A, is how you could think of it. Now, the Bema seat is not the seat that a judge would sit in to issue a verdict of being innocent or guilty. The Bema seat was the place in which a judge that oversaw the games, or like the Grecian games, would sit, and when people would run a race, he would stand up at the end of the race and say, hey, well done. As they got to the podium, he would then give them their reward, a crown. You could think about the flowers that they'd put, you know, the wreaths around their heads. You could think of it maybe even in terms of today, as a parent sitting and watching your kids play a game, and they, do a, they have a great game. Maybe they hit that home run. Maybe they make that winning catch. Maybe they hit that winning basket. And at the end of the game, you say, hey, because you did such a great job, we're going to go out for ice cream. You kind of think of it. That, that's kind of the image I want us to have as we talk about the Bema seat. Now, when does all this take place? Here's a, a helpful understanding. Luke chapter 14. Jesus is telling a story, and he's talking about kind of the end times, and he's using the description of, the, of a banquet to help drive home a point. And so in Luke 14, he says this. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest also they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. Here's the thing. He says, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The judgment seat of Christ seems to be something that's going to take place after the resurrection of the righteous or the resurrection of the just. That's actually something that we talked about and referred to in week one. And we talked about it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you happen to miss that, I want to encourage you to catch up with that conversation. We talked a little bit more of what that will look like and the timing of that. The judgment seat of Christ, this needs to, I want to say, isn't the thing that will determine salvation. That was determined by Christ's sacrifice on the cross on our behalf. That was determined by our faith in him and by his grace. All of our sins as Christians have been forgiven. Romans 8, 1 talks about, so therefore there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You will not be condemned for them. We should not look at the judgment seat of Christ as God judging our sins, but we should look at it rather as God rewarding us for our lives. Yes, I think there'll be some level of us having to give account of ourselves to Christ. But partly, I I think surely, we may have some moments where we answer for the sins that we committed. But the majority, the primary focus of the judgment seat of Christ is reward. Now, at the judgment seat of Christ, believers are rewarded based on how faithfully you served Christ. How part of the mission you were of what he came to do and to accomplish. We talk about it from a biblical, theological church lane of talking about the Great Commission, where Jesus commands those that are following him, hey, go into the world, preach me, teach people about Jesus, all that I've commanded. Lead people to faith to in me. Baptize them. And, and so part of it is how faithfully we gave our lives to those things. Were we a part of that process? Also, I think how victorious we are over sin. Did you overcome temptation? Or did you give in to temptation? In those moments, that we, we all have our wrestles. We all have these things and challenges in our life. But there will be a level of accountability to, and, and reward connected to it. How well did we live victorious over these things? leaning into Christ, leaning into the strength and the movement of the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in our lives on a given moment. Also, the Bible talks about reward based on how well we hold our tongues. Do we use our tongues to edify people or to tear them down? The Bible speaks of believers receiving crowns for different things based on how faithfully we serve Christ. Jesus even talks about it when it comes to how we use our talents, how we use our treasure. Do we use our gifts that God has given us, both 
financial, but also kind of our physical talents, our emotional talents? Do we use those things to build our own personal kingdom, or are we about building God's kingdom with those things? That's what faithfulness when it comes to invest. And Jesus even taught the fact that we can actually align our hearts correctly by how we give of those things. See, the antidote to selfishness is generosity. And so he wants us to live generously so that we become more about investing in his kingdom and the things that really matter that will last versus our own personal kingdom. Now, James 1.12 is a good summary of how we can all think about the judgment seat of Christ. It says this. It says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So when we get to the judgment seat of Christ... Bible gives us this perspective that we will be rewarded based on our faithfulness here on earth, and you will be giving these crowns as a demonstration of your faithfulness. Now, for some of you, you might be trying to figure out what that will play out like. I, I'm pretty sure it's not going to play out by the fact you're going to be walking around heaven with this big crown, and you're going to look at other people go, that's kind of puny. Like, you're lucky to even be in heaven, you know? You know, look at my crown. Look at all the crowns I got. It's not like you're going to be walking through heaven, pulling a wagon, clank, 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 clank. Hey, guys, check what I got. That, that's not the way that this is going to play out. See, think about it for a moment. A crown is given to you by Jesus. Yes, it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be full of jewels and all that. But Jesus, the one that has scars in his hands, the one who had a crown of thorns placed on his head, your response isn't going to be walking around heaven, hey, look how big my crown is. Our response is going to be a response of worship. We see this picture in Revelation of 24 elders that had their crowns given to them to Jesus. And you know what the picture is? The picture is that they sit down and they kneel before the throne of Jesus and they take that crown that Jesus just placed on their head and they place it down at the feet of Jesus because in that moment you realize, I don't deserve this. There's nothing I did to deserve this. I didn't earn this. The one who had a crown of thorns placed on his head gave this to me by his grace. This is yours and in the rightful place. We take those crowns off our head and in worship, we place them down at the feet of Jesus. It's not about how big our crown is. It's about the opportunity it provides us to stand at the feet of Jesus and to worship Jesus. Him. The, the next thing I want us to take a look at in finishing the conversation by talking before we get to heaven next week is talk about the second judgment that the Bible talks about. So the first judgment, the Bema Seat, the judgment seat of Christ. The second judgment, if you're taking notes, write this down, is the great white throne judgment. The great white throne judgment. It's important to recognize that this is a judgment that Christians will not be a part of. Now, this is how the great white throne judgment is described in the Bible. This is from Revelation chapter 20. I'm going to start reading verse 11. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. Jesus is the one seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small. Let me, in other words... Those who are significant, and even those that are seemingly insignificant, from all of history throughout the entire world, are there. Standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. So all their deeds have been recorded and placed in the books. The way that they lived their life. It says in verse 13, The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them according to what they had done. 
Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Now here's the important part that we don't want to miss here. Verse 15. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Who is that? Anyone's sins that were not covered by Jesus. Anyone that didn't call out for the grace of God. Anyone, if anyone was judged by his works alone and not by the perfect work of Jesus. If their name is not written into the book of life, a person's thrown in the lake of fire. That then becomes their default destination. Let me pause. Because I know what a lot of you are thinking and wrestling with. Whether or not you're new to church, whether or not you're a church person, if you're a Christian or even if you're not a Christian, if you tend to lean on the skeptical side of things, there's probably a moment when you read this, go, hey, wait a minute. How can a loving God send people to an eternity of suffering? How could he send people to hell? That just doesn't seem right. Like, that doesn't seem fair in the way that this should operate. I want to address that question because it's a question I get all the time and I know it's a question that you probably wrestle with yourself. And there's two ways in which I want to address this question. And it all centers around certain assumptions. We must first define what does it mean to have a loving God. This phrase assumes things about God and answering the question at hand if we come at it with flawed assumptions, we will always have a flawed conclusion. Our culture, get this, our culture, not the Bible, our culture defines a loving God as someone that is completely non-confrontational. Being someone who tolerates anything that we want to do. But that's not a biblical definition. First John First in John 4.16, it says that God is love. This means that God does not possess love as you and I do. He is the very definition of love. And therefore, he can't do anything that is unloving. The law of non-contradiction states that something cannot be both true and untrue at the same time. So if God is love, then he cannot be at the same time unloving. So the first fallacy present in this question, how can a loving God send someone to hell, is the idea that allowing people to go to hell is somehow an unloving act of God's part. If we as humans decide that God is somehow wrong to allow unrepentant, sinners to pay what they deserve to be paid, to pay their deserved penalty, then what we have done is we have declared before God that, God, we are more loving than you. We have set ourselves up in position to be above authority of God. When it comes to judging, when it comes to the jury, and as a result, we close the door to any type of deeper understanding. So therefore, the first way in answering this question is to agree with Scripture is God is love. Therefore, if God is love, everything he does is a perfect expression of love. Now the second fallacy presented by this question, how can a loving God send someone to hell, concerns the word send, which denotes kind of an action on the part of a sender. Like you send a letter. You send a reward, you, you send a request, you send a gift. All that action is done by one person on their own. No action is actually taking part on the side of the letter or the request or the gift. However, this understanding of the word sin isn't something that can be applied to the question at hand because God has given human beings freedom to participate in life in, in, in their own choices and ultimately into their final destination. 
The, the way this question is worded implies that if anyone goes to hell, it is the result of God's unilateral action. The person being sent to hell is just a passive victim. That kind of idea, at every way, disregards the personal responsibility that God has entrusted to every person. Now, the Bible is very, very clear that unbelievers, those that have not placed their faith in Jesus, Romans chapter 2, 5 and 6, say that they are storing up wrath against themselves. And that God will give to each person exactly according to what he has done. Believers will also be judged by Christ. But since Christ's righteousness, his goodness, has been imputed to us, and our names are written in the book of life, it's a judgment about reward, not punishment, according to our deeds. I mean, how many of you have ever witnessed somebody else hurt someone and never have consequences to what they've done? Sometimes it's horrible. And somehow they just seem to escape. Nothing seems to happen to them. I mean, I know for me, myself, I've been in moments where I've just been even driving on the 417 and watched some crazy lunatic driver running around at 100 miles an hour, zipping in and out of people. And I've had those moments where I'm crying out for justice. I'm like, I need a cop right there. You know? We, we all have these moments in life where we see something and we don't see any consequence, and we cry out for justice. We want all the things that have been wrong, we want those things to be made right. That's exactly what is taking place at the great white throne judgment. God has taken all the judgment, all of the sin, from all history, Things that you and I, we can't even fathom happen. He's bringing all those things to an account. At this moment, there will be payment for the sins that were not covered by Christ. And because if you don't have his righteousness, you are guilty. This is the punishment for that sin. And not only is that fair, it's called justice. See, God gave each and every one of us freedom to choose in how we want to respond to him. See, if he forced us to respond a certain way, we'd just be robots, pre-programmed to do this. To give us no option but require obedience would be a violation of our free will. Love is only love when it's voluntary. We cannot love God unless we have the option of not loving him. Because God honors our autonomy, he will never force us to surrender. He's never going to force us to be loyal. However, what we have to grasp is there are consequences to whatever choice that we have and we make. There are only two kinds of people in the end. There are those that will say, God, your will be done. It's about you. Whatever you ask, wherever you lead, I will obey. And then there's a group of people that God will simply look at and say, obviously, it's all about you, so your will be done. I'm not going to stand in your way. Both of them have eternal consequences. As C.S. Lewis, a great Christian philosopher, said it this way. He said, all that are in hell, choose it. You choose it. Now, now here's the thing. I, I hope the truth that we just read today, I, I know it's not necessarily that feel-good conversation, but this is an important conversation. The, the truth is the thing that sets us free. And I want you to experience God's freedom in your life. That there's no greater place to be than under his authority. 
in every area of your life. And so those that are Christians, if you're new as a Christian, if you've been walking as a Christian for a long time, be challenged, be encouraged. It, it, I know it's hard. There are moments in the Christian life where I get tired and yet that's why the Bible in so many different places talks about don't grow weary in doing what is right. For in the rightful time, you will find your reward. The reward is coming. Don't give up. Continue to press on. But here's the other thing. For those of you sitting here, and maybe this is the first time you ever heard this, I, I want you to seek out the truth of God. Ask him to reveal himself to you and what he wants to do in your life. There are, we will all at some point stand before him. And I want you to be ready. I want you to know what's coming. And you don't have to live in fear. But it's also a, another call to us. Because there are people all around you that don't know Jesus. Family members, neighbors, co-workers, which judgment do you want them to be at? That's part of our responsibility. Yes, it's important to have a personal relationship with Jesus, but it's also just as important to have a shared relationship with Jesus. God has uniquely placed you exactly where you are in your circle of influence for you to influence and invest in people for eternity. Not for your personal gain but for their eternal gain. Let's not take that lightly. Let's have the courage to have conversations, to talk about spiritual things. And then it's between them and the Lord. All we're asked to be is a messenger, to share the message, and then allow God to do his thing. Just a moment where the band's going to come out and they're going to lead us through a, a, a last worship song. But I, I want us to approach the throne today as we worship with an understanding of what is coming. Sing loud. Sing with joy. Be encouraged of what salvation means and the reward that will be waiting for you. Stay faithful. During this time, we're also going to have an opportunity for us to just give financially. And the reason why we do that, again, we, we talked about it earlier, Jesus talks about that we can actually direct our heart towards the things that really matter by the way that we show and live generously. And so we give practically financially of being able to say, God, I'm investing in what matters in your world, not my world. And it's just a way for us to move our heart away from selfishness driving us more towards his mission driving us. And so I'm just so thankful for those that support to work here regularly. And I'm on the journey with you in that process. But let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the morning and the message and the truth of what awaits on the other side. God, I, I pray that this would be something that we'd all just stop and think and evaluate. Where am I at with you? Where am I at when it comes to the mission? Where am I at in my own faithfulness? But God, don't let us stop there. It's not just about putting a few things on the paper of what needs to be improved, but Lord, give us the courage to actually do those things, to bring a change, to act differently, because God, we realize there's a lot at stake, and we love you, and we're thankful for the way you've loved us. In the name of Jesus, I pray.